Trading Global Markets Decoded with Daily FX is brought to you by IG, the world leading online trading and investments provider. Welcome. You're listening to the Trading Global Markets Decoded podcast with Daily FX. I'm your host, analyst and editor at Daily FX, Martin Essex. We bring you trading insights on the world's biggest market, the $5 trillion a day FX market, as well as commodities and other key assets while describing the opportunities that may be emerging around the world. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening, depending upon where you are in the world. And welcome to this podcast. With me today is Dr. Harold Malmgren, who was a senior advisor to four US presidents, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon and Ford. He's an economist a geopolitical and geosecurity strategist, and an expert in global finance and governance. Dr. Malmgren is also a writer and media commentator, and his core subjects include the US and global economic outlooks, trade policy and financial market issues, and the linkages between economics and strategic security issues. He has a special interest in automated and high frequency trading and the problem of financial market herding and has written on all these since the 1960s. Harold, welcome. Thank you for calling me, Martin. Um, Harold, we'll talk about economics, finance and trade in a moment. But first, perhaps you'd tell me about your latest project, which I think is called the Malmgren Strategic Institute. What is that? Well, um, over the years, uh, unlike people who are action oriented, uh, most people who are action oriented don't write about what they're doing, rely on other people to, uh, who, who are really voyeurs to, to tell you what happened. But it was my habit to take notes all the time and or write publicly or give addresses explaining what I was doing. And all of this piled up over many, many years into a, a large flow of reports, notes, publications. Um, and uh, some friends of mine said, can we have a look at this and decided there's so much here. We should set up an institute just to. Uh, pull up all the stuff that I've been saying and show how it foretold much of what has been happening. Oh, excellent. Uh, the way um, of thinking. So, so that's what we're doing. Very good. Turning to the economic outlook, coming back to today, I'm sure you've been asked this so many times before, but uh, how soon do you expect the global economy to recover from the damage caused by the coronavirus pandemic? Well, as you know, there's a wide array of opinion on this, ranging from President Trump, who thinks we'll have a recovery like a, like a rocket, hmm. uh, all the way through to um, the, the more cautious warnings of institutions like Morgan Stanley, and especially Jay Powell, the head of the Fed, who is very, very cautioning about the pace of recovery and the likelihood we won't see real recovery until next year. And where do you stand on that spectrum? Yeah, uh, in my view, we're, we're, the recovery will be far slower than the markets are expecting you. Uh, because th- during this break, many, many businesses are either going out of business or they are reconfiguring what they're doing, including their supply chains worldwide, uh, rethinking the product lines. Uh, rethinking where they produce in the world. And I think we're not going to see a rapid bounce back. But the main question is new orders. Um, We entered the downturn um, that began to really whip the economy in uh, early this year. But actually, the industrial downturn had begun last year. And uh, already there were clear signs of industrial contraction long before the virus hit. So we have to think, industry is going to think that as the baseline, not the virus. Um, And um, we entered the downturn with substantial overcapacity. The most visible example was the automotive sector. Everywhere you look in the world, there's a pileup of unsold vehicles in the ports and in the uh, 
in the U.S. case, in farm fields, just miles of unsold vehicles parked in the grass. Um, so new orders are crucial, and new orders are not showing any substantial rise yet. So production might be ramped up, but orders are not going to be there to create the demand. Against that background, it's perhaps remarkable that we've seen such a strong rally in share prices and, and indeed other so-called risk assets recently. I suspect yes. from that that you think current prices are unrealistic, uh, too optimistic about a swift, strong economic bounce back. Is that right? Yeah. The, uh, the, look, the, uh, the prices are driven by Fed policy, which is aimed at lifting liquidity and there's all that liquidity has nowhere to go because the, the yields on interest are too low. So they're piling into stocks because it's the only thing you can buy into. Uh, and, it's, and it's inflated by what I call a high level of, of intake of hopium, um, you know, which has everybody convinced that somehow the Fed has their backs. And no matter what happens, how awful the problem is, the Fed will keep inflating the asset values. Um, it overlooks completely the likelihood that um, sooner or later these fallen angels in the bond market or the, the credit companies that provide credit for autos and other consumer products, so we're going to have credit crash. And so how do earnings stay up in this atmosphere? I think we're going to have broad earnings disappointment. Um, and the market will look increasingly overvalued. Uh, how far you can stretch opium, I don't know. But the uh, market is definitely way overvalued. So in brief, do you think that the stock market rally is largely driven by um very loose monetary policy. It, it, is yes. this a bubble that's going to burst in the stock markets? It will. Um, what is the catalyst for the burst is we have yet to see, but it may be a crash in the, of insolvencies of some key businesses. We're already seeing early signs with uh, Hertz rental cars and uh, such such. Uh, ostensibly blue chip organizations. Um, we may see it in the commercial mortgage backed securities crash, um, which is quite possible. Um, more, more and more bond market de declines that, that, that create a, a process where the Fed just can't keep up with the insolvency. Um, mm. But what, what, some figure will happen and then there will be a rush to the exits. Um, I, I guess the key question is when that's going to be, which will be the question that none of us can really answer. No. Turning to trade, and I know you're very much a trade expert. Um, what do you make of the US-China trade dispute? Could it be disruptive for the global economy long term or do you see them coming to some sort of agreement? <laughs> well, it began with a trade dispute led by President Trump, who saw that the trade relationship is unfair, but it has morphed into a much broader question of the reliance of the U.S. economy on China across the board, including uh, national security, military security issues, but also now because of the pandemic, um, um, our over-dependence for pharmaceutical su material supplies from China, over-reliance on medical equipment gear. Um, but it's has spread to other countries. I mean, it ranges all the way. For example, Australia is having a, a major rift developing with China, which um, you know one would not have thought happened before because of the dependence of Australia exports on China. Uh, it's dividing countries in Europe. I, I believe this split is now going to widen. Uh, it will prove uh, difficult for some countries, particularly Germany, which has so, become so reliant on exports to, to China and businesses operating in China. But 
it's it's um, going to be uh, troublesome um, in everything from semiconductors uh, all the way up to supply chains of virtually any kind of manufacturers. And uh, everybody's looking at how that will turn out for the, U the U.S. and Europe. But actually, the really big question is, how will it turn out for China? Because China has reduced its dependence on exports to some extent, but it's still highly dependent on export growth. And it, it's, the export demand for China is going to dry up. So China, China's now downturn is probably going to get deeper. And of course, the U.S. is also um, arguing about trade with with its partners. So with countries like Canada, with the EU and so on, countries that it doesn't have the same sort of problems as it does with China. Yeah, well, this is Trump. Uh, Trump has long had grievances about trade irritations with Europe and Canada. Like, like, um, to some extent, Japan, Korea. They go back to about 30 years ago. But these are mostly issues of 30 years ago. He, he has lost sight of the fact that um, we, we had difficulties, not only with China, but with other countries about outsourcing, um, you know, jobs leaving the U.S., uh, the trade imbalance in agriculture. But that's 30 years ago. He, he's essentially out of date. Uh, and almost all those problems have since then changed. Uh, what we see now uh, is a rise in insourcing into the U.S., um, not only from Japan, with Toyota having led the, the shift of production from Asia to the U.S. of oil mode, uh, products, but also the German, the big three German automakers are now firmly established in Alabama and using Alabama as an export platform to sell uh, their products to Asia and Latin America. So it, the world is changing, but the news, the news uh, cycle has left, kind of left, been left behind about two, two or three decades. <laughs> um, that brings us obviously to the question of the linkages between economics and strategic security issues. So do you think that the US against that background is is stepping back from its global leadership role? And if so, could that damage Western security much more generally? Um, again, Trump is doing this with an America first point of view built in because he's trying to maximize um, manufacturing inside the US. But if we look a little bit more um, objectively from a slight distance from Trump himself, we can see in the security area, the Defense Department is encouraging um, clusters of cooperation with the most important one being U.S. and U.K. Um, U.S. and U.K. are firmly uh, interactive on almost everything from uh, um, you know, aircraft like the F-35, um, most advanced, you know, aerial defense system, um, through uh, telecoms, communication, and of course, there's always been this close tie of intelligence, U.S. and U.K., uh, which continues. And that is now spreading out through Australia which is building, uh, unnoticed un by the news media, Australia is building a defense industry. Uh, they, they're opening a shipyard to build submarines that will be mainly purchased by Japan and the U.S. Um, they are going to become a major, uh, <laughs> the world's largest training round, training area, training range for trying weapons, for training personnel. Um, a lot is changing. So in the security area, um, yes, the U.S. will try to make all its semiconductors inside the U.S. after years of relying on China. Uh, and we may enhance our relation with Taiwan, but, um, but it's, it's more than that. The U.S. ties with, for example, 
Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and Finland uh, in the military area is now quite intense, just not noticed by the press. Um, so, and uh, in, in, in that cluster, Belgium and the Netherlands have also joined, and Italy. It's just the, the slow, uh, slow, slow partners are France and Germany, which can't quite figure out whether they want to be part of this new thrust or whether they want to develop something that is French and German. So if I could try and if I could try and summarize what you just said, it sounds as though you're more optimistic about the U.S. remaining a, um, important strategically. You're more optimistic about that than you are about the U.S. economy. Is that fair? Yes, but let's take another point of view in terms of global activity. U.S. has a troubled economy. It's true, but there's no sign that the dollar. Uh, is not is is becoming a weaker element of the global economy. That's you know there's a lot of rubbish written or talks about that the end of the dollar, <clears throat> but um, I think there's generally forgetfulness that besides the dollar that we see in the uh, in the Fed's hands, there is this massive thing called the euro dollar market, which is a multiple. Uh, you know it's variously estimated. Uh, between 10 and 25 trillion um, it is a huge market and it's a, it's a spin-off of the US so in in recent weeks as the European Central Bank and its members have been uh, constrained and there has been a dollar shortage for them as well in South Korea Japan Brazil the US as it did at the end of the uh, post Lehman crisis the U.S. has been expanding swap lines, essentially giving dollars to them, and they you know, trade euros for the U.S. to hold. But without the U.S. swap lines, um, the entire euro system would be in a crash. So is the U.S. not taking a lead? I think the answer is the U.S. is in the lead. It's just it overlooked. That's interesting. Okay. With me today is Dr. Harold Malmgren, who was a senior advisor to four U.S. presidents, is an economist, geopolitical and geosecurity strategist. We'll be back in just a moment when I'll ask Dr. Malmgren about the financial markets. Trade with Daily FX parent company IG for low spreads, intuitive platforms and round-the-clock customer care. Learn more at IG.com today. Dr. Mumgram, I mentioned in the introduction um, your work on automated and high frequency trading. Do you think that computerized trading is, is a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it's an inevitable thing. I mean, computers are getting faster and faster and um, it's the nature of scientists and, and people in the financial markets to exploit the opportunities that faster information provides. Uh, I first got attention, gave attention to this. I had a dinner with a longtime friend of mine in Japan, a man named Atsushi Saito, who had become the president of the Tokyo Stock Exchange and was in the process of, of merging it with the Osaka Stock Exchange. So as a CEO, I thought I will talk to him about uh, high frequency trading. And it was interesting, part way through my questioning, he said, look, he said, let's eat. The, the process is simpler than you <laughs> try to think about it. He said, what, we're, what this is all about is um, front running the market. Um, front running is technically illegal, but now we're finding ways for some people to move faster than the others see what's happening and jump in and take the advantage of being first instead and it's being it will become bigger and bigger until a handful of firms will dominate uh trading and everybody else gets prices set by these front runners uh, and it's turned out to be quite correct i mean it's um uh, it's just a few firms uh, that now uh, truly dominate 
um, the uh, high frequency trading and high frequency trading is a very large part of what happens in the markets. So is it good or bad? It's the reality that it's unavoidable. Um, it, it will, the speed will continue. The problem now lies in other aspects of this. Number one, increasingly the instructions to machines are not by humans, they're by yeah. algorithms. Um, and, and eventually will be artificial intelligence uh, construct where no human is involved at all. Um, and that will create massive high momentum movements uh, that result in congestion. Let's say if you have a down day and uh, a heck of a lot of people want to sell, but <clears throat> there are no buyers because the High frequency traders simply shut down for a few hours, say, okay, let the market do its work, and then we'll come in when we can take another, when we can reap more gains. Uh, so, and we began to see signs of that with uh, flash crashes several, well, more than a decade ago. But we're going to see flash crashes of, instead of minutes, we're going to see flash crashes eventually of hours and then. Um, a, large parts of the trading day. So this is something we have to think about and deal with, but I can't say it's good or bad. It's just inevitable that this is the process we're going through that from changing of markets. The Fed is trying <coughs> to keep up with it by integrating a lot of its open market activity uh, through its partner in Chicago. Um, um, I got a mental block, but um, the largest high frequency trading firm. And uh, indeed, the Fed has a large division now located in Chicago uh, to exploit that, that uh, process of being, uh, being able itself to stay ahead of the market. <clears throat> so I, I think it, the problem is going to become one of uh, crisis. If and when the market starts going down rapidly, unwinding ETFs will be really hard because some of those index, indexes uh, are simply big companies and they can be sold, but unloading the whole basket, it will be really hard. We're going to get a lot of days where trading has to be halted, not just for an hour or two, but for the entire day, maybe maybe even several days. That is, is not... Yeah, unimaginable. It is likely. So, is market pricing now then is is it now less accurate than it used to be? It's it's not market based anymore. It's based on this artificial liquidity injection, not just of the Fed, but of the Japanese and the Chinese and the ECB, uh, Bank of England. In all of these ways. It's somewhat, by the way, uncoordinated. Um, but what is the price for anything? It's, uh, it's yeah, you know, the price for the biggest companies are dominating the markets because they keep rising. Uh, the price for the rest of the market is quite depressed relatively to the, to the market leaders. Uh, no one really knows what the relative prices should be. Because the uh, monetary policy is simply like a flood, um, erasing all the normal benchmarks. Is this what you meant when you wrote about um, the problem of financial market herding? Yes. Um, when I first saw flash crashes um, in their small, you know, a few minutes here, a few minutes there. Again, I had dinner with the then governor of the Bank of Japan, uh, Mr. Fukui, who was also a friend of mine. <clears throat> and I said, what happens when you get a pileup uh, of s s sellers anxious to unload and a withdrawal of the high frequency traders? And he said, well, we central bankers don't like to talk about that. But he said, we'll just have to shut the markets. And I said, for how long, an hour? He said, no. I said, days? 
He said, maybe weeks. Really? Goodness. Now, this is a long time ago. This is, you know, this is before Governor Carolla took over. This is before the wild QE of recent times. But it was interesting at the time because it was in the days of, of uh, Fukui and, uh, and um, Draghi's predecessor, his own Claude Trichet. Uh, it was, you know, at the tail end of the Greenspan years. I knew Greenspan well, and I knew Trichet well. And indeed, at that dinner, I said, well, what, what is the view of Trichet? And he said, it's the same. And he said, it's also um, 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 King, the, the Bank of England governor. He said, we talk about it, but we don't like to talk about it publicly. But yes, this, this possibility of a, of a um, stampede uh, resulting in withdrawal of the computerized traders, no backstop, no market makers. He said, yeah, well, we'd have to shut down. So I think it's something we can't just ignore. It's, it's a problem, a latent problem yet, but it's something that uh, you know, can happen under, uh, under circumstances where confidence is lost in the markets. Turning to governance, if I may, um, what do you think are the main current issues, um, uh, both for governments and indeed for corporations? Yeah, the, um, I was thinking about this this morning. The, um, the problem of high concentration in the U.S. is now getting attention. A uh, small number of firms dominating key sectors, and um, and, the, and that combined with the widening income gap or wealth wealth gap that it results from many forces, but it happens to come at the same time. So it could be said the U.S. is now becoming like Russia, you know, a handful of oligarchs running large segments of the economy. Um, independently of all the market forces. That, that kind of issue is going to become a, a major issue, and it has already begun with Trump approach, which is maybe we have to look at uh, some of his enemies, you know, Amazon and Facebook and so forth. But um, this issue of concentration is, is building. Uh, Elizabeth Warren has talked about it quite a bit. It, it, whoever's the president in the next few years, whatever the Congress is, this will be a big issue. Um, do we need a rebalancing? Do we need more competition and less concentration? How do we get there? It's not easy because the concentration is not just inside the U.S. It's global. Pharmaceutical concentration is high worldwide. Small number of pharmaceutical companies dominate everything, um, communications. Um, it, it's, um, it, it's going to be a subject uh, coming at it from many points of view, including how you tax it, how you tax the big guys relatively everybody else. Um, that, that's, that's an issue that's slowly now emerging into the public eye. Um, then we have um, this question of income inequality. The economics long ago, in the U.S. especially, simply let's, swept aside discussion of how, how, the, how the results of prosperity are distributed. You know, who got, who got the gains? And, you know, it, it's gotten to the point where the last ta tax uh, um, Act of, of, of 2017 that Trump pushed through the uh, the um, sorry I had a distraction phone call there but uh, tell you what why don't we stop there um, if you'd like to turn off the phone I will um, I'll just wait and then ask you the question again if that's all right yeah I'm one second just hold while I find the damn phone here okay it's done um, so let me ask you the question again. Um, yeah. Turning to governance, what do you think are the main current issues for governments and for corporations? 
Well, the main, the, the main one is increasing concentration of power in the hands of a, a smaller number of dominant players. Um, it's the, it's the uh, Google, the, the, the uh, Google Alphabet, the uh, Amazon, um, Facebook phenomena. Uh, it, uh, it's very strong in pharmaceuticals. Uh, in transportation, airlines, you can make a long list. And Jonathan Tepper wrote a really good book on the concentration of power that was published just this last year. Um, it's going to be a popular subject um, for politicians because it also relates to the widening income and wealth gap that is evident and is resulting from everything from tax policy, which gave the gains of the most recent law, tax law 2017, to the, the large corporate sector and large uh, independent businesses, but virtually nothing to the rest of the economy. Um, and then the policies that relate to that are things like corporate buybacks. It's forgotten that the buy buybacks really were be well, only allowed under Reagan by getting the SEC to change the rules uh, to allow a kind of safe haven for companies to buy their own stock because it's a form of insider trading. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've gotten used to it, but there'll be a lot of visiting back saying maybe buybacks are a really bad idea. We really need, need to aim uh, profits either into productive investment by companies or else they should pass it on in dividends and move it out into the economy where others others can use it for investment. What do you uh, mean when you talk about the role of governance in our well-being? Well, this is basically, you know, uh, governments work on the basis of some kind of deal between the working population and the, and the rulers, and uh, it takes many forms in many countries. You know, the many many variations of it. But everybody seems to have forgotten that the deal was, it goes back to feudal times. You know, we let you have the power over our area, but in return, you defend us from harm from others. You provide police and fire protection. You help us with with problems of disease. Um, and th th there is a balance. Uh, now, economics has simply dropped the subject of how wealth gains are distributed, so we've kind of forgotten about all of that. But um, governance, the balance of governance that's acceptable must involve some kind of uh, sharing of gains that is plausible and reasonable and, and uh, acceptable. Um, now, it's not surprising that there's a fight going on about, about how this works uh, over the years between unions and the corporate world, between unions and governments. Uh, it's an ongoing thing, but it's now gotten a little bit extreme where, uh, where the, uh, you know, when we look at wages gains, I hear all these nonsense reports that wages have been rising recently and if you stop and look closely you find yes wages are rising for the top 10 percent of what you might call supervisory workers and professionals who are like doctors and engineers who are on payrolls but for, the, for most workers wages are not rising or they're rising very marginally so in so, fact the sort of old idea of trickle down economics isn't really working anymore it it seems to have dried up let's put it that way <laughs> okay i know you've advised many businesses from sovereign wealth funds and banks to computer services companies strategically now what are you saying to them about how they should be positioned in the markets well um you know the recovery process Right now, what I see, a process that began in the last two or three years, slow down, 
in industrial production worldwide, uh, beginning to be almost in manufacturing contraction by the end of 2019. And at the same time, slowdown in global transportation of goods, that is air freight, sea freight, railroad freight, truck freight, everywhere in the world has been slowing and now we have really a dramatic slowdown in the movement of, uh, of goods that are made, manufactured, or fabricated for consumption use. So while services continue, the movement, the transportation is changing. Uh, and more and more companies are thinking of ways to make things closer to the end user get rid of the supply chains or, or make them shorter so that you can tailor product changes for the local demand. Uh, the more tailored uh, product systems mixed with services. So I think what we're going to see is much less uh, shipping by air, sea, and land, much more relocation of manufacturing um, and then reconfiguration of how you make things. And this is the most important part. Slowly, there has been a rise in knowledge about new man-made materials that are not steel or copper or not using industrial metals, but rather um, creating materials uh, that, that uh, don't need to be dug from the earth, don't need big uh, smelters. And we're going to see more and more of that being the way we put things together. And there will be, with that, a very fast rise now going on in what we popularly call 3D printing. You know, sending specs uh, by internet to somewhere and making something on the spot. And I mean, most people think of that as, oh yeah, that's plastics. But now uh, it's, it's advancing into... You, um, new kinds of metals that are not earth metals. Um, and um, for example, uh, one of our national laboratories in the US has just devised a way to make the core of a nuclear power plant remotely by a version of 3D printing. Um, I, I know in the automotive sector, some of the companies are now at the point where they are thinking to make entire parts, uh, the, the frame and the, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the structural parts of, of automotive vehicles by 3D printing without much human interface, uh, very close to the end users. So this so is almost a, it's like a sort of pullback in globalization or a reverse yeah. of globalization, more localization. It will be. And I think this means that companies have to think differently because what they do in each place will be somewhat different and certainly different from what was done in the past. But also in parallel, there is relocation of traditional industries. Um, I mentioned earlier in, in this conversation that German automakers, the big three in Germany, which are a critical part of the German economy, you know, they represent a very large part of the total German export engine, and the German export engine is almost half of the German economy. But the big three Germans are now quite happy with this footprint they have developed in the southeastern U.S., particularly Alabama. And now Airbus is thinking to produce major aircraft parts and maybe even original aircraft in the U.S., not only for the U.S., but for, for the platform that were on the one hand uses Mexico and Canada, but on the other hand can sell to Latin America and to Asia without the pressure of the heavy hand of e e European Commission regulation. <laughs> I must ask you this question before I let you go. Um, I believe you have a family association with chess. Tell me about it. Oh, uh, yes. Well, um, when I was a kid, uh, I didn't really, I wasn't aware, but I grew up in a working class immigrant family. My father 
played chess with me all the time. And uh, and I got tired of it mentioning because it basically he won every time he played. So <laughs> I, you know, but, but he taught me a, a, a lot about it. And then I discovered when I, in my early teens that um, my I was named after my uncle, the same name as my uncle, and he was um, a, 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 a co-champion in world correspondence chess and a major player in the blindfold chess playing and and multiple player chess playing with the Russians and uh, and some of the wow. North Europeans. So. And then I talked to my uncle, and my uncle said, well, your father was actually the better player of, of both of us, but he <laughs> didn't decide to be an athlete. So you grew up in his heavy pressure. I said, yes. Yeah. He said, did he teach you how chess is played? I said, yes. He told me that the first rule is every day to wake up and memorize one of the great games so that over a few years you have a repertoire in your head <laughs> that when you see a move, you can say, ah, 1917 April. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how it's played. And, I, and I, I just found the sport became overbearing. And so uh, in later years, I took an interest in go and, ah. game and other things. But, but I grew up under 10 years of relentless beatings by a chess master. <laughs> <laughs> and the nephew of a chess grandmaster. Dr. Harold Malmgren, thank you very much for talking to me today. It's been absolutely fascinating. Thanks for your time. Well, I hope it stimulates thinking in a lot of quarters. Um, I'll, I'll give you one final thought about rethinking. Uh, in around 1980, the CEO of IBM uh, called me in and said, will you help us rethink? the future of IBM. And uh, I got into that in depth. And I came back with, I said, look, the, your business is leasing mainframes. So you're kind of a vending machine business. And you're in the cash flow business. But the big mainframes day is over. And what we're going to see is a keyboard on every desk. We don't know what we'll call this, but the keyboard has to have a memory so that when you go when you go to bed at night, you can pick up the keyboard in the morning and it remembers where you dropped off the previous night. You don't want to have to do it over. And it has to have enough memory to have software in there mm -hmm. for word processing. So I said, the only future is to take where you are, you're in every major corporation in the world with your mainframes and say, okay, now let us do all the services, the accounting, the, the supply chain management, the payrolls, the R&D. That's where your future is. Well, he told me I didn't understand the business. <laughs> oh, dear. And about eight, nine years later, several members of the board said, had you prevailed, we would have saved us you know, slipping all those years and having everybody pass us in the in the long distance race. But this is why I think big thinking about what is fundamentally different is very important for business and for markets to try and think where this is going rather than where it's been. And the same about the recovery. I think the recovery is not going to be returned to what exactly we were doing in January. It's going to be quite different. Well, that's my overall comment. Dr. Harold Malmgren, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for listening to the Trading Global Markets Decoded with Daily FX podcast. This podcast is brought to you by IG. Check us out at dailyfx.com. If you love the Trading Global Markets Decoded with Daily FX podcast, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time.